Bing. All right. So great to see you guys. You know, I tell you, I, I'm glad that we're uh, kind of getting back into a rhythm with with these uh, Zoom calls. And just as a the latest update, I've got three more subscribers for the Zoom YouTubes, and we've picked up, I think, another member. Um, uh, so it's just it's it's catching, it's catching along. And uh, so with that, we have layout updates tonight. And then I think the next regular Zoom, we'll do layout updates with Charlie and perhaps myself and uh, maybe Roger. I don't know. And then the week after that, uh, we're going to have uh, car loads because Charlie's done a lot of work around his uh, uh, his pot hoppers. I think he's putting together a pontoon train. And Rhett called me last night, and he's got an artillery train that he's done with a few flat cars with uh, limbers, caissons, et cetera, um, and a couple of uh, horse cars. So that'll be a few weeks down the, down the road. Uh, okay, so with that, who would like to kick off with a layout update? I think we have DC, Paul, and Ron. Paul? Unmute, my friend. Yeah, I'll go. Cool. Um, how's everybody doing? All right. My, Good. My, my layout I presented, it's almost been a year now, um, February 25th last year. And the layout started as just a battle of Mission Ridge and has grown into a lot more. So to update what I went over, I rewired my bus, installed an auxiliary bus, um, did my first electrical turnout, and I'm planning on doing uh, frog, the bullfrogs from Fast Tracks. I installed new phase one which I got a lot of good feedback last time and uh, got a lot of good ideas and actually got done with a lot of it. Sure. I refig refigured some track to connect to phase two, completed the ridge construction on the battlefield. And of course you got to add to it. I'm gonna install some side panels to my bench work, install a backdrop, plan to paint the backdrop, plan hey, on- Paul. Just yep. one thing I want to add is if anybody doesn't, they probably all know, but, but Paul's doing a version of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Right. It's uh, from Chattanooga to um, through Dalton, and the next town is to be determined. Mm -hmm. uh, I listened a lot to uh, Ron with you hiring students for a backdrop. I'm going to start working on that. Uh, in store wire, wiring for the three remain, remaining different circuits. And I bought a PS4 circuit breaker and I'm trying to figure out, and I think DC helped me figure out how to wire it, that I could have it for a DC and DCC um, operation. The rest is down the road, just working on mm. what to do with the hospital and use you know, what buildings were used during the battle. Phase two, with connection to phase one, finalized track plan, design geography, and determined structures. I got a little section in the south for south occupation. And then I actually have a, a lower level that I'm going to design a phase three. So I'm really early on into my uh, layout. This is what it looked like in February 25 to 21 a year ago wow and based on the feedback i got i took out there was a there was a, a rail coming in through here and it went through this tunnel and there was a dead end based on the feedback of the group i just ripped this out i wanted to have a loop that i could before i f put the other phase in that i could run trains around so i put in these uh to uh this crossover, which worked out nicely. Uh, this is the back end that I'm ripping up, that there was a dead end here. You see where paint stopped? 
this yeah. rail here is going to come around to my loop and the outside rail is what's going to go to uh, phase two. I also had this mountain, which is Mission Ridge, and I had my uh, my setup here. And so what I did there was I actually covered it and made it part of the mountain, built in some things, a little wire, and then I started to paint it, and it's, it's painted all brown now. So this is all hidden now. Then I went to work on my bench work, start building my bench work. This is my L that came out over here. It's tough to do this stuff by yourself, you know, to hold it up and screw it in and everything. Uh, but I just used a bunch of boxes and all the way over to the right. I think I got this from you too, Ron. I'm not sure who it was in their layout to do these. these uh, and they worked out very nicely to do these little angles so I could do storage underneath. It's actually very strong. And then the other section I went to build out, this is actually almost eight by four. And this is what it looks like when I extended it out and built the rest of it out. So my layout looks like this now. The original was here. Chattanooga is over here. Here's the ridge. I'm actually putting this turnout here that I'm, I, I'm gonna put in another two by two piece here where I'm just gonna probably use this as staging to put all my trains on. Uh, this section back here is the south and this is the new section in the green that I have all of the um, layouts. I'm not sure exactly what I'm gonna do with this big area yet. Wow, and that looks great. And this, this is what it looks like now all the way to the left. You can see I got it all built out. I'm starting to put my track down to see how it looks. The mountain's painted brown. Uh, the middle here is the other section where I got storage underneath. If you could see all the way on the right over here, this is my Christmas layout that stores nicely under this big eight by four. Put my Christmas tree on top of this, and I have a uh, actually the Bachman DCC uh, starter set that I run uh, sound upstairs under the Christmas tree. And this is what it looks like over to the uh, right now when it's wide open. And that's and the bottom over here is where I'm going to put in probably a 19, eight, 19 early late steam early coal. And underneath, I got like seven boxes of, of Al Muller's, uh, all of his structures that are gonna go in, into the phase three. I haven't even opened five of the boxes. It's gonna be like Christmas when I open them. I opened two of them, the stuff was like amazing. So, and uh, that's where I'm at. Wow, great progress. It's gonna, it's challenging to run it. The reason why I went with a PS4 is I'll be able to run the bottom level and the top level, uh, either DC or DCC. And without doing a circuit breaker that you could do direct runs to each section, um, I didn't see how I could do that. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're going to just keep it DC for now? No, it's DC and DCC. Oh, I thought you said you... Both, but I didn't, oh. I didn't install the PS4 yet. Okay. Um, I'm still working on the bench and the track. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to need some help. DC did, did the programming for his already, so... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> so are you, what, are, whose turnouts are you using for this? You know, I looked at turnouts and I guess it's my blue collar union upbringing. My father was a blue collar. Everybody in my family was blue collar. And instead of going for the best, I went with Atlas because they're a local American and their, their home base is in New Jersey where I live. Mm -hmm. And I've had no problems with them. 
I really haven't. That's great. Uh, they're not as nice as uh, the Picos or, you know, other. Shinohara, uh, yeah. Shinohara's or whatever. But, uh, you know, I went with a, a local guy and buy America. America. Cool. As wow. opposed to buying Canadian Fast Tracks or uh, Pico England. Very cool. And now you have that, that Crutchfield house. Is that lit? This is lit up. I got switches on the side where I could light it. Yeah, I could light ha- I could light a third, two thirds, and I left a third of it black. So I have like switches to turn it on and off. Nice. Nice. The other thing I bought at one of the shows was the, um, the fiber lights. I think it's uh, Darwin. Oh, you yeah. Don't, you don't run the bus. And I'm not sure if I'm going to run an electric bus wire all the way over to this section over here. I may just use that. I may just use it for my Christmas layout, too. Right. Does anybody use that? Guess not. No. Can you guys hear Paul? Yeah. Okay. I want because some your images are frozen on my computer. Yep, and that's it. That's the uh, that's a year later. And I was happy you asked me to do this, Tom, because I got a lot done in a year. <laughs> you did. Looks great. It a looks great. It, a lot Indeed. of it was really struggling with the turnouts and figuring which ones. Um, and you know, even when I did this area over here. I didn't plan well enough with the uh, layouts. So when I did this area over here, I should have electrified these things when I was putting them in. Now I'm going to have to jerk around with uh, <laughs> electrifying them and drilling holes after it's all laid out. Right. Ah. That, and I should have put sixes in. These are fours. Uh, oh. I put all turnout number sixes, which will give you a, a little bit better ride on the turns i had some problems with these that i had to straighten them out uh with derailments i learned you don't really want to put fours on the main main line i hear that i do have one on the main line that i couldn't avoid because of space this one over here is a four but a six just wouldn't fit what i was trying to do Has anybody put a PS, anybody put a circuit breaker in like that and try to run, um, for, you know, s- separate layouts? Not me. Not me. That's my, uh, that's my story. Beautiful. Nicely done. Yeah, man, that's great. You're having fun. Yeah, I, pre- I appreciate it. Like, there's a lot of guys, some of them aren't on here that gave me a lot of good ideas and really, r- really helped out to figure out what to do. Wow. Cool. Good. All right. Um, thank you, Paul. Appreciate the time you put into putting this together. Uh, DC, you up? Yeah, I can do it. <laughs> first Tell how excited out. we all are. Too. <laughs> I was like, ah, <laughs> ah damn, bro. <laughs> Enthusiasm's killing me there, DC. I, yeah, it's like, wow. <laughs> I need to take a break. Uh, come on. I'm assuming everybody can see that. Yep. Yeah. Okay, this is kind of what I've been busy at for uh, since the last update. Um, I think I had uh, gotten the framing for the bench work done and uh, the decking cut. Um, I went around and I put in bracing where I needed. Um, As you can see, I'm up to my old tricks with uh, using uh, used lumber. that Z bracing is actually, I think, a uh, 
guardrail or two from a uh, uh, infant's bed. We sold the bed, but somehow we got left with the guardrails. Um, then I ran a uh, bus wire for it. Um, before I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to do as much work as possible before I glued down the decking. So I've run the bus wire, um, and that's kind of what it looks like. I went with I have an NCE system. You're supposed to be able to use a uh, 14 gauge wire, but I went with the 12 gauge. And my reason for that was that somewhere during the course of my lifetime, I came up with a couple spools of 12 gauge uh, um, multi stranded wire. So that's what I ran. I also installed. Uh, these are uh, on the left here. You can see my cursor. Those are four PS4s. And on the right, those are two of the NC or the PS um, things for the return loops. Uh, DC? Yes. We're still looking at the title slide. Yep. You never uh -oh. went into slideshow mode. <laughs> That's weird. Okay, let me. Um... Shoot, it's changing on my screen here. Let me just try this again. Go up to the air screen. If you go up to the top left and go from, oh, there you go. You can see it now? Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, here's the Z bracing with the used lumber as an old piece of door framing over there on the right or left or left here. Um, since I'd finished the floor, every time I did anything, I put um, plastic down because, you know, I suppose neatness counts, but <laughs> I, in my case, I used a lot of plastic. Um, See the next one. Hey, there's me drilling holes to run bus wires. As you can see, I just moved the uh, um, the decking off to the side while I was drilling the hole. This is showing the uh, some of the bus wire again. You might see some different colors simply because um, I was trying to use what I had on hand. This now is what I, I was just talking about. These are the PS4s, and these two uh, modules on the right are for the return loops. Um, one point out, you'll notice that the there's uh, blue tape wrapped around this set of wires, red tape wrapped around here, green tape, black tape, and yellow tape. Um, so as I go throughout the underneath the layout, wherever it um, wire passed to a, a support beam. Uh, I ran some tape around it so down in the future, even though theoretically I know how everything is running, I should have a memorized um, insurance. I, I also built this stand out of some scrap lumber so I could uh, keep this all underneath the layout. Um, other things that I've done, I did run the uh, lines for the uh, NCE uh, modules or uh, consoles. I was originally going to have five of them. I decided since it's probably only going to be me or maybe myself and a couple other people down there at a time, um, but I really only needed three of the five. So that's something else I've been doing. Um, had to do some changes. Um, you can see the structure up here. All of a sudden, I realized after I had put this module in that there was a um, turnout above here. And I didn't think my uh, wires would go from down here, through here, through another uh, eighth inch of a plywood. I mean, and then uh, into two inches of foam. So I, I built that and I built one on the other side too, again, just to help uh, ease some of the wiring. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So 
Uh, there's me testing the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Looks know, like bulletproof it's, bench it's, work. It, it, it's, it's rated to 300 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Self test. Yeah, that's that's I, I glued down the styrofoam. Uh, what you see what I'm doing there is I'm actually since I've done it in modules. Um, because for, I don't want to leave my family with the trying to figure out how to get it apart and difficulty. The adhesive I've used to um, join to glue the the, uh, to, the 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 styrofoam to the um, to a plywood decking um, is a really good adhesive. So I run. This it's a piece of used, but it's painter's tape along the the base. And then what I will do is put some of the adhesive down on the plywood, and then also on the styrofoam and join them together. And uh, this is the product I've been using. Uh, it used to be there was a product called Linden Gripper. And you can't find that anywhere now because now it's PPG, which I assume means Pittsburgh Paints Glidden Gripper. And it's supposed to be a slightly different formula. That stuff works better than anything else for gluing uh, styrofoam to plywood or styrofoam to styrofoam. It's basically a paint primer. And you can use it for, you know, priming brick or anything else. It just works really good. I got this uh, gallon of it at uh, Home Depot. I'm sure they have similar product at Lowe's. Uh, after you get the, the, the paint on both the styrofoam and the plywood, then you put them together and you weight them down overnight. And it's my high tech uh, system here. <laughs> just gonna sort it uh, one, two, three blocks and other weights I've accumulated over years, a small portion of my paint collection. And even up here, you can see a uh, corner of a three drawer cabinet that's got uh, all, all filled with uh, musket miniatures, rustic rails and other metal figures. So it, it has a good weight to it too. Um, so I got the, uh, the pink foam down. And uh, mm. now I'm making another adjustment <clears throat> here. In the corner, I decided, uh, let's see who made the trestle. <clears throat> I don't think it's Cabri. I'm not sure who, it's not Bowman. Anyways, I got this uh, viaduct kit and then it took me forever to find somebody who made matching stone. Uh, but the way I wanted to run the viaduct I needed, and the angle I needed to have here, it was bringing it really close to the edge. And so I just made a little insert in there. And here you can see me uh, gluing down the top to the, um, the support structure. Well, after all the pink foam was down and in place, uh, I started working on fast track. So I've been building turnouts Wow, um, this is this is number four. I'm going with uh, points rather than stubs because a lot of my uh, turnouts are really really close together. Um, as a matter of fact, um, here you can see where there's two two turnouts left hands uh, and a lead, and I've figured out how to use a fast tracks jig to kind of basically build one turnout, but you've got longer pieces extended out so that these are, this is actually one piece. And the, if you look right in here between the throw rod and uh, the frog on the one on the right, uh, it's, it's about a, an inch, inch and a half shorter than it would have been if I built two number fours and put them together, which is gonna allow for, uh, getting a little bit more track work in the space I need to get it in. <clears throat> um, in the town of Avella, which is what I'm working on, um, it's going to have to have a 60 degree crossing. And I ordered one from a manufacturer 
Um, and it kind of came, I looked at it and I put it away and it's been over a year. And I got it out to look at installing it and it was a real mess. So um, what I've done is I took it and I kind of leveled the pieces off. What I've got here, the paper is a printout from Fast Tracks. Okay. Oh. And uh, for their 60 degree crossing. And the crossing itself is from BK Enterprises. And then what I've done is I've got um, these, these copper PC board ties. <clears throat> Those are all from Fast Tracks. And I cut them to the length as though I was scratch building the fast tracks jig or crossing. And uh, it was interesting. I was going that my, my grand plan was to use the double sided scotch tape I had to hold the uh, turnout to the paper while I did it. Uh, but it seemed to have disappeared. So instead, I had to turn over some uh, scotch tape and hold it down. And that's why you see these. Uh, Whoops. These uh, strips of masking tape. So that's going to be where the wood ties go. Uh -huh. And um, so it's all soldered in position, rigid. I've uh, cut the gaps where they need to be. And uh, let's see. Let's just, wow. And that's what it looks like kind of now. Um, my. <laughs> My soldering has actually gotten better. Um, I was talking to Juan about that a few minutes ago. But I've got the gaps cut here. You see the plastic ties? Um, mm -hmm. That's because I've got a lot of extra plastic ties and getting off, to, off of the, what was it, micro trains? Not micro trains. Micro scale? Micro, -scale. micro engineering? Engineering, micro engineering, yes, the micro engineering code 55 rail. Um, because if you look here, the on the lower right hand side, this is the uh, tie spacing for that point you get from uh, um, micro engineering, and on the left here, you see more of the correct tie spacing for the uh, time frame I'm working with. Uh, so mm. basically what I did is I, I removed a whole lot of the ties. So I got a bunch of ties and then I would super glue one tie, making sure it was absolutely square across. Now what I'm doing here is just a straight track. It's not a curve. Okay. And then I get this, this little spacer. It's like, uh, 0.25. <laughs> 1, 0.125 by 25 siren and just put it there and then put another drop of super glue, slide a tie and pay it lace. You move your uh, spacer and you just keep going that down the rail. Um, now the super glue, you know, it does, it holds it pretty remarkably well, but you will get ties that break loose, especially if you mess with it, which from my point of view, that's not that big of a deal because a few skewed ties here and there just will give it even more realistic effect. Mm -hmm. And um, I can also do final adjustments as I'm sticking it, final adjustments as I'm sticking it to the, uh, um, in place. Okay, we're at the, uh, uh, next one is, oh, these are the jigs I made. This is just a piece of real estate sign rip so that it fits between the two pieces of code 55 rail. And so they're, con they're evenly spaced throughout and it's straight. And down below is a fixture I made oh, 20 or so years ago that I found again today, or was it yesterday, um, to, to uh, make a, a my diorama in which I used uh, bamboo skewers to make the rounded wooden ties. So um, after uh, as as since we were coming up now to um, to do the presentation, I thought that I, I needed to do 
have a little bit more. So what I decided to do was go ahead and paint the decking. Um, even though with the weights, uh, I tried to get as evenly as possible when I, when I was gluing them down, there were still some variations that I didn't like. So what I did is I did some sanding of the pink foam board. And then I uh, ran beads of caulk do the seams and actually over here on the right, you see this diagonal, there's a piece of scrap styrofoam because the gap was bigger than I liked it and I didn't want to waste my, uh, my caulking. Oh, funny story. Um, I've, I was looking through all the tubes of stuff I've had around and I found two tubes of caulking. And I took them out there and laid them on top of the decking. And I figured, look to see how much was in them. And one had just a little bit. And I said, well, it's older. I'm going to try to use it. And so I'm lo loaded up in the gun. It seems to be working fine. And I accidentally bumped the other tube, which kind of rolls and gets on the floor. And I looked down, looked OK. So I finished up the one tube, went down to use the uh, other tube of cock. And lo and behold, I broke the nozzle off. Oh. oh, well. So, such is life. So, it gave me another chance to get out during the COVID. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, then I get to see me cutting in the edge. I primed and painted the decking uh, yep. just because I'm going to be spray painting some of the track work and ties. And um, I've heard that some of the products can, you know, just dissolve the pink foam, and I just wanted to be assured that it didn't. Um, here's a photo of me watching paint dry. <laughs> Literally, I, I, I work so long during the day, and I reach a point, and okay, I'm just sitting there, and my mind's going, my mind's going, but the body's just going. Well, it's just sitting there. It's what it's doing. <laughs> it's like we're done for now. <laughs> We're done for now. Uh, there, uh, I, I do have a number of structures. There's the uh, scratch built uh, City Point engine house. And uh, it's, I still have to do some adjustments to get the height right. Um, there's a little bit too much space under the uh, track here right now, uh, under the track here right now. So I got to lower it a little bit. Um, but the City Point engine house itself was originally built on pier, so that's why I built mine. And then it caused it, um, well, some issues in getting to figure out how to uh, get it installed on the layout with simply uh, breaking off all the legs underneath. Um, where else am I here? Uh, that's kind of where we, I stand this today. Um, none of that track work is glued down. Um, what I've done, I don't think you can see from here, but on top of this, these turnouts up here, there's, I don't driven, I've drawn a line from here and it goes down every time you see the space, you see the line. And that is the line that will allow me to have this rail set perfectly straight. Mm -hmm. Um, because the rail actually sits on top of the line which gives me the space I can allow for the, the track in the front. Um, what you're going to see in the back here, oh, let me go to the next, next couple of slides. You can all get to it. Um, this is my 18 degree radius um, template that you're looking at. It's made out of uh, three pieces of old brass track I, I soldered together. Um, and I have very tight radius curves on my way out to be mm -hmm. able to get what I want to do in the space. Um, I also try to keep the track work about two inches away from the walls. Um, mm -hmm. That happens to be a spacer. What I wanted to show you is this building up here, the two-story building with the scratch-built water tank, everything. That was the inspiration for my pro car and foundry. I, I built that of a couple of kits, but as often happens, it was supposed to sit over here with a track running into it. But when it's sitting over here, you couldn't see what was going on. 
with the tracks and back. So temporarily it's sitting up there. Um, this, these are going to be the, uh, the main structures when I'm going to kit bash them together. The used buildings I got at eBay, whatever, cheap. Um, and uh, for my crow car and foundry, it's going to have three tracks to turn out leading to. I've got a 424 that I'm going to turn into a dedicated engine for the foundry. Um, and that's kind of where we stand as of today. It's to wow. be continued. Wow. Meticulous. Questions. Oh. Meticulous. He, uh, how many that engine turnouts? has DC. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. How many turnouts are you going to have DC? How many turnouts? There'll be 39 total. Um, <laughs> as it stands now, there's a couple more I could put in. But... Um, Sometimes I think that simpler might be better in some instances. And um, I've got 14 of them done. So I still have 25 left to do. Yeah, that totals 39. Your City Point engine shed was beautiful, DC. You, oh, uh, I you. love what you did with the doors, uh, the angled planks. You know, I, that's just, that's the way it should be done if you're going to do it. So it looks yeah. fantastic. Well, it, it does need a few repairs since I originally built it. Um, this past summer, I discovered that the air wa water was dripping from the air conditioning duct that ran <sighs> above where this was sitting. In the, and I, at that point, hadn't uh, thought about that. So I hadn't had plastic on top of it. So we've got some interesting weathering effects, and I've popped out a couple of the uh, the hinges on the doors, which I have to replace. So, but thank you. Is that is that up because the, <laughs> that's where you go underneath the engines? I'm sorry. The way oh, no, it was just when they built it. If you look at the city pit point turn up, turntable and engine house, they're they're built on uh, highlings. Pilings. And so a lot of what the track work that you see that's not on uh, pilings is actually fill dirt they brought in. You, there's one picture that shows a couple of flat cars hauling fill dirt, uh, hauling dirt out towards like the turntable, you know, to, to, again, to, to fill in between the rails. Hmm. Now, the James course, River is temperamental. It flooded then it floods now so i'm sure they needed something to protect against it yeah well the track's going to run they're going to be three you know uh three lines into the engine house but the track's going to curve over here and to the over this lower area here which is um again this will run out to the delaware river and then i'm going to have warehouses over in this area. You put a turntable in there? The turntable <laughs> was originally on the other side, but I'm probably going to move it. If you can, can you see my cursor over here? Yeah. yeah. Over, it would be over in this area here, mm. the turntable. Okay. So it won't be as in the correct position. And of course, after I got this built based on my best estimates, it turns out it is a little wide and a bit long but uh, I wasn't going to start it over, so. <laughs> I do have the windows. Actually, there, there's someone I can't remember who in the group has a photo of the back side of it. Not, 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 not side to the left here, but the side opposite the doors that shows four windows. So I got those four windows ready to install. Uh, but I thought I'd want to get up some, some trains up and running before I started messing with that. I don't have any of my uh, wiring other other than the bus wire. I don't have any power to the actual uh, lines yet because I haven't permanently installed them. All right, All right. Great progress, man. You've been motoring. You, jeez. Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Cool. All right, uh, Mr. Flowers, are you ready? Yeah. Let me just share the. 
Thanks, DC. That was great. Appreciate the time to put it to that. That was awesome. Awesome to see you make progress. Right. So oh, I like that. Well, I, I, I've mentioned before that I also do woodworking. So this is a project that's kind of interfered that I that I just finished. It's an oak uh, bookcase. So it's one wow. of the um, many projects that I've been doing. That's, and that's beautiful. Awesome. beautiful. I bounced back and forth between that. And then, and then my grandson came down and we started working on this. So we put this together. Awesome. Uh, He'd never painted with a paintbrush before. I mean, you know, a big paintbrush, like painting the house. So I had him painting the, the, the way to teach him how to paint. And then he calls me up last week and says, so I, I, he said, I want to look and see what my layout looks like. So I took it, went downstairs and had the camera and, and he looked at the mountain and he said, it's not pointy enough and it's got to have snow on the top. All mountains are pointy and have snows. So this is a six-year-old talking. So this is our railroad track. So it wheels up underneath the, 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 my layout so that he has something to play with and we mess around with it and uh, he's, he's looking forward to putting uh, uh, rock castings on the side of the mountain when he comes back to visit so nice. that, was, that was my other project yeah. and, 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 and between this group and him I mean it's like he calls up and says okay so where are we at now what do you got done <laughs> <laughs> you got anything else done you know, and I'm thinking that's it and you go that's all well, when, the, when do we get the trains? When are we going to run trains? Because we were running trains on this before I put tape on it so he wouldn't mess it up. But uh, yeah, so he, he's a good inspiration. But, You're uh, training him right, Ron. Yeah. So this is where I'm at right now. So the backdrop's all up. Uh, framing's all up. Uh, by this weekend, I'll have all of the, if you can see the cursor, um, I'll have all of the sub um, bed down uh, halfway out because I'm going to be, I'm going to do the backdrop and paint it all before I do anything else so I can get in there and get at it. And I'm uh, talking to a couple of students this weekend uh, about coming out and helping me with uh, the backdrop. So the backdrop's all completed. Um, and you can see I'm beginning to put photos up of areas from Martinsburg so I can begin to sketch some things out, you'll see here. Um, so this is all done, uh, the backdrop. Wow. Um, this, is, this is my corner from hell. Um, <laughs> This is the corner that keeps cracking. So, you know, I just keep adding tape and then it just keeps getting the, the plaster, the mud just keeps getting whiter and whiter. So, uh, but uh, so far, since the last time I talked to you, DC, I haven't found a crack. So, if yeah, I, I would die to ask you that. Something, <laughs> something's working. So, I'm like, I'm crossing my fingers and going, you know, damn, I don't want to come down here one day and find like this big crack. Down. So, right now, I'm just, I'm just waiting. So, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to sand and hopefully I can paint because I got everything else painted. Um, so everything except for that little corner, the corner from hell. Um, and that's where the bridge goes. And that's where I'm going to have to do all the, the shell and not have um, um, and use risers and stuff like that, because I'm not going to be able to just lay plywood. Um, so I also cut all the uh, templates for everything. So this is now up um, ah. and put this up in preparation. Now I'm going to start sketching out. And I figured out that uh, I started scaling out the road so I can begin to put marks on the backdrop as to where the roads are. They're way mm -hmm. out of scale. Um, so I took my little ruler. And it's like the average size of a, of a road in 1860 was like 12 feet. Those are like 30. It's like I'm building a freaking free one. So I, gotta, <laughs> so I, gotta, I gotta reduce their size a little bit. They're a little too big. Uh, so I got all those cut out laid them up there so we can begin plotting out what's going to go in the backdrop and start painting the backdrop and then finish my corner from hell uh, and get the sub road bed down. Um, and then the, the, and that's, that's about it. So I, I've already got um, the Pico flex track for all the hidden track areas. Um, so I'm going to put all that in first because I'm going to build a, a programming track in, in one in the staging area. Let me go back and I think mm. on the slide you can begin to see no, what did I do? Let me go back to the. Yeah, you can see back. This will be all a staging area. So this is this is hidden track. Uh, okay. So I'm not going to bother to hand lay any of that stuff. I'm just going to use Pico and use you know store bought, store made turnouts and, and things of that nature. But that's where I'm going to put a programming track. So I'm going to put that in, and if I go to the other end this end that the same thing so i've already actually i bought um those um quick strips that you can get from uh, fast track 
the, that you can put together and, and kind of what um, DC did where he used it to, to put inside the rails to line them up. Well, they make these quick sticks that you can just stick together and glue together. And I've got 18 inch radius so I can set up the flex track, but they'll be, so I'm going to do that first. And so it'll stop right there. And then, mm. everything, else, then everything else will be hand laid. Uh, that's why I was asking DC. I'm starting to buy the, starting to look into the accoutrements for the, uh, um, uh, building the uh, uh, the fast track templates or the fast fast track guides for soldering the turnouts. So uh, I've hey, Ron, that. is that an opening in the back there? Yeah. So the train will go underneath. There'll be hills around that. So that'll be blocked from view. So you won't be able to see how the train exits the layout and goes back into the staging area. Okay. So it'll come back around. Um, oh. I, I've ordered the turntable. So I, I contact call, talk to the guy for quite a while. Diamond about putting in the turntable, um, which will go in here uh, in the center of the roundhouse. Yeah. Uh, actually contacted um, a guy, a company that builds um, barns and, and such that they actually use old construction techniques, uh, um, mortise and tenon joints for that sort of, and they also do it for some home construction, but he had actually reconstructed a roundhouse in Pennsylvania using wow. techniques. So I called him and said, uh, he and I are going to talk, and I talked to a couple architects about, can you give me some idea about how they'd have actually built the, the beams and structures for the roundhouse so I wow. can plan all this out? So they're going to, they've, they've sent me some sketches and said, this is kind of the basics. So we're going to mortise and tenon and all that kind of good stuff with the little frames that go in for each of the bays. Wow. Um, so I, I'm, I'm doing some off layout stuff. I'm starting to scratch building some of the buildings. Um, those are on another on my workbench uh, right now. Uh, wow. but, uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at at this point. So I'm hoping that by Sunday, when the kids are supposed to come over and take a look at this, that I'll have um, uh, sub row bed all the way around, and my corner from hell will be done uh, huh. and painted. Uh, <laughs> and so then we can start actually painting the backdrop, uh, and then I'll continue to do the scratch building of the structures and things like that. That's kind of a quick update where things are at. So fabulous work. Uh, so you have a loop to loop. So on the end, it goes through and back and around and to the other side. Yeah. So the, the mains, the mains go straight across the layout and then they split and become, it, it's a dog bone. Yeah. So it's two dog bones and the two ends loop together. Now the, on the opposite end, I'm actually going to run um, a switch off of the loop and it'll take it into a, a um, um, a staging yard so I, I extended it so originally it only went out nine foot and it was just a loop and I went I've got an extra nine feet here that I'm not doing anything with so I'll just make a staging yard there so, so I'll put a switch on that uh, and that's all done I can I can throw the stuff on the top of it and get the foam board um, foam core glued down to it and, and then because one of the things I have to do with the backdrop is so it's not flat so it, about you know, 25 30 feet from the track, the city of Martinsville actually sits up on a hill. So this uh, begins to elevate. So mm, you have to yeah. actually elevate that. And they actually cut it away. And you can now, when you go down, if you remember when we were there, there's like a, a, a rock wall. And, yeah. and just, just where they cut away and, and leveled off all of this area for the yard. Um, and so I've got to build this up. And, then sort of, and I want to do that before I want to get where the roads will come up and what their elevations will be before I start painting the backdrop. So we've got some sort of perspective on um, how that'll all fit together and um, that kind of thing. So right. I'm about ready to start painting and, uh, and then I'm, cool. start, I'm, I'm gonna start soldering so I can screw up some things and put way too much solder on things. And, <laughs> um, you know, starting to look at wiring and you know, how I'm gonna run the buses. And I probably have a couple of questions because I've already realized that at a couple of places, I can already tell I'm going to be reversing pol polarity because I have some crossovers from the main. So the mains run parallel to one another. And yet around the station, um, there'll be crossovers. that So a train can come from the west, cross over, and then pull in front of the train station. Well, as soon as you do that, you're going in the opposite direction of the polarity from the main coming to the other. So now it's like, oh, damn, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to have to wire uh, what do they call those things that change the polarity? Um, uh, reverse loop? 
Yeah, well, not every birthday. It's a um, little, the little um, board you can get that'll automatically change. It's a, rever it's a reversing loop board. Yeah. yeah. And and get one of those. It's like, oh, I better start counting how many places I do this. Because <laughs> this could be a little bit of a problem. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where everything's at. And um, that's great. Well, I, I finally got, like I said, I, I, I think the plaster or the, the mud that I used to, because there's seams all throughout this, because obviously I couldn't find a single sheet of um, that hardboard or temper board that would go all the way around. So there's a seam right. right there and there's a seam hey, right hey, there. Hey, Ron, I got a question. Sure. Where the um, the track work goes through the hole in the backdrop to the staging area, mm -hmm. um, how many tracks go in there? Is it just one track, two, two. tracks? Two. Two. Have you considered um is there a way you can figure it's only one track goes through there on, on either end then you'd have two reversing loops on either end and then you wouldn't have to worry about what's going on in between well those wouldn't be very those aren't the difficult parts in terms of reversing loops it's where i take like here and cross over the main going from the west to the main going to the east mm. obviously the polarity is going to be running this way and the polarity will be running that way. So that someplace in there, that polarity has got to get switched if you want uh -huh. to run the train back hey, on the other track. What I'm saying is if you do that on either end, you don't have to worry about it. If you yeah, yeah, that would be true. Oh. So that's a neat way to avoid it, DC, if you, uh, but operationally, you might want to stay with the two track. You know, it, well, that, that, that's choose your poison, I, right? Sure. Right. Well, that, the, well that, that's so what I ended up doing. It was I was looking at something similar to the basic dog bone shape here, but um, I ended up with going with just one single track to keep things closer to the aisle, and also it was just easier to have a reversing loop on either end. Well, the and one I, thing about Martinsburg and and that run from. Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember uh, from basically Baltimore out to just the other side of Martinsburg was it was the only two it was the only two track main line in the United States at the time. Okay. So to keep that two track main was is historically accurate. Okay. So that's why I did the ball. Uh, right. Got it. Cool. So, so uh, are you are you going to be doing Lincoln Pin by any chance? Yes. Cool. I'm, and I'm thinking about different ways to do it so that it's a little easier to manage move, pulling them in and out. Um, right. And one thing I kind of thought about was somebody at some point in time, it said something about using like maybe not a staple, but something like that, that was a U shape that you could yeah. just grasp with a magnet in the middle. And, and then you could use that as the Lincoln pen. And, and, and you could actually, I'm sure you could put you know, a head on the end of each of the, to, you know, sort of simulate the top of the pen, but sort of make something that was shaped more like a staple. And that might be easier to manage to actually lift and pens out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I don't think, know. I'm going to play around with them. I've got a bunch of them in a drawer someplace. I think Bernie was experimenting with that. Was he? Bernie uses magnets. Yeah. Yeah. So did uh, Al Mueller. He used okay. just steel pins and magnets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, wow. I couldn't use an absolute staple because I think they're made up of aluminum. No, they're steel. Are they steel? Staples. That'd be good. But I'll experiment around with it. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to plan on using Lincoln pin. Wow. Look great. Good, Ron. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just glad I can start getting all the big tools out of the freaking basement. I mean, so I have a chop saw down here and I have a table saw and I mean, that I've hauled down into the basement so I could cut this stuff up. Right. Without going back and forth from my wood shop to down here. <laughs> now, are you I was like, God, I'm gonna be glad to get that crap out of there. And I, and, and I don't put plastic down, so I'm not like you, DC. So like, I have to go back underneath this deck and bust pieces of plaster up so I can vacuum them up. And, now, are you going to paint that backdrop blue to match the walls yes. behind it? Yeah, it'll start at the light blue that's that's at, you know right at the horizon of the track. Yeah, and then it, and it'll come down, and 
um, the, the background will all be painted. Um, I'll be using, uh, a re uh, I'm trying to remember the, the type of airbrush I'm using, uh, but I'll be airbrushing most of the scenery up to where we start building buildings and putting roads through, okay. that kind of stuff, which is where I'm going to have the kids help me. Ron, what is the diameter uh, diameter of your roundhouse? Who? Oh. Off the top of my head, I can't tell you. Someplace like oh, that. Oh, that's all right. It, ballpark would be just fine. I don't even know if I can ballpark it. I'd have to look. Oh, don't worry about it. Look, wow. Uh, it should be about two feet. Yeah. Oh, Diameter? In, in terms of, of uh, yeah. actual size here, yeah, it's a little over two feet. Because if, if yeah. that whole that peninsula is four feet in depth, and that okay, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so your your far track is about three feet away. Correct. Yeah, so I go, I've tried to stay within thirty two to thirty six inches from reaching, so I don't have to really reach. The only track that might, well, that's not bad back here, and the switch is here. So, but they yeah, they really have. Any... Hmm. Okay, so you don't have at least you don't have any structures in front of the, the main yard there. No. Yeah, no. The, the only thing is this, and, and this may be a little large in terms of scale, because when I blew it up, then it's like, oh, I'm not sure that that structure was actually that large. Right. Because um, with any rail, I didn't really mess with trying to do these to scale. Um, okay. It, this is the only one I did to scale that I worked really hard to make sure it was done actually to scale so that I can play with the size of these. Are you doing O scale? No, H O. Yeah, that's gonna be gorgeous. Yeah. Mm. Don't, don't get jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, now the thing I got to do is, is I, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm in there messing with the stuff when I'm painting, and I can't tell whether the white paint is dry and I painted it, or whether it's wet, and I, you know, I, I, and it's like that's because I've still got this light bulbs right here, so it's like. Probably one of the first things I'm going to really have to do when I really start messing with the backdrop is actually add all the, the spotlights. So I've got mm -hmm. big banks of spotlights that'll go up. Oh, you're doing can lights. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 Who was that? Do you have can lights on yours? Somebody I saw there. I do. Yeah. Um, email me what you're using because I'm kind of putzing around looking at what I want to get. Sure. Yep, I replaced all the incandescents with uh, LEDs. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yep, yep. Yeah, matter of fact, after I did it, I was looking through uh, John Armstrong's, one of his books, and uh, just to get an idea of some things. And I, I found this diagram that he did that's actually the shape of my layout. And, um, and it had lights exactly how i have them in the aisles kind of and i was like wow okay if john armstrong did it i guess i'm kind of close to like <laughs> what would be cool this is acceptable right so that was great so that and that, and I've, and i've started building i've started going through all the structures that i already have built i don't know if you can see that but that's, yeah that's a that flickers like a yellow candle so it goes in all the structures and it comes with the the resistor already soldered in Oh, that's nice. So that, yeah, so I've started, I've, I've gone back to some of the older buildings, uh, went back to a couple that I have from Al, and he just used white lights. So I'm right. going to replace those lights with with the, the sort of the ear oil lamp, ambient, yeah. Yeah. You know, flickering light kind of ambience. Um, and it's like, you start thinking, I was talking, when we we're talking Saturday, said, you start thinking of all these things and you start thinking, damn, if I don't do this now, it'll be hell to try to get this done later. I mean, you start putting structures on anything, it'd be really cool if they were lit and like, how do I get into the building now? <laughs> if I put it down, if I put the bottom on, it's like, mm, better start thinking about that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, so, I, so as I'm building all the structures and going through, I'm, um, I got a bunch of those and um, gonna wire those to a, and get a DC transformer. Uh, and have a separate bus for all the electricity that runs all that. Right. I and I just say I had bought a bunch of these. Uh, they were white bulb lights, and uh, and then I got a hold of this. Um, it's a yellow paint. Yeah. I forget yeah. Clear. I just, I, I've been using clear Tamiya. That's exactly yeah. what clear I've been using. Tamiya. 
and and coating it over uh, the LEDs, like yep. head, headlight lenses and that sort of thing. And it's great. Yep. Yeah, it works really well. I had to put on about eight coats to get it where I wanted, yep. but it works yep. really well. So you don't have to <laughs> worry about not using the, the clear lights. Yeah, these are, these are about 48 cents a piece. Get out of there. Wow. Okay. We cool. Get them, um, Evans Design. <laughs> Is one company and Lighthouse Design is another company. That the, the same places that sell those, like if you want to put a fire, they they have three oh. together, orange, yellow, uh, and you can hook them up and they flash and flicker. So I've got one of those for a couple of places that I think will have uh, a flame. camp. Yeah, cool, beautiful. One of the things I talked to the guy Evan Designs about uh i was thinking you know for, for your top lights they make them they have in different colors and he's he does a lot of arduino you know programming so however long you want to make your day you can make it so you have red and then going to white and then red on the other side and then a blue for like night light so you can have sunrise sunset and day i haven't got all the way yet but you know, i talked to him a little bit about it and he's game for it wow so, Wow. There's a, there's a, there's like a guy that. in England that's got this awesome layout that he 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 has the regular cans that he uses to light it, but he also if you, when you see it and he's got it hidden in behind a balance, but if you get on the other side and look at it, so he's got the regular cans for the spots, but in between them he has red, green, and blue lights, and so when he wants to go and he set just the way you were talking about Walter, he set it up so that he can face and I've seen it. He's run a video of phasing through light and then it, and then it's coordinated with as dust begins you begin to see lights in the building start to flicker on it's really neat wow. what the guy did Love i'm it. just going to be happy to get cans with nice white light on <laughs> <laughs> great good man thank you so much thank you so much that was brilliant i love what you're doing so, uh, you know, I, uh, I, th I would like to, so Ed, Mr. Caddy, I think you're a new member to the group. Are you not? Yes, Mr. Katie. Katie, Ed, so tell us a little bit about your interest and what, uh, what draws you here. Well, uh, Andrew invited me. Uh, one of the things I'm, uh, interested in doing is, uh, sort of like the, the golden age of broad gauge, which was just uh, sort of during I, I want I think it's sort of like it sort of like peaked right after uh, after the Civil War, uh, but then they uh, uh, it, it was basically after the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, eventually, every everyone started to go standard gauge, no matter. Uh, uh, it seemed that there was no longer an advantage of having the broader gauges. Um, right. in Canada, Canada actually was, uh, they, they didn't have an official gauge from my understanding, but they only, uh, uh, they only had funds for f five foot, five foot six. And uh, from there is, it's basically that's what everyone started building is the five foot six. And then uh, I think once the transcontinental railroad came in, it's like, all right, we'll change it all over to uh, standard gauge as right. the official language or the official gauge. So you're, you're exploring building a layout of that era? Yes. Would huh. that be uh, Erie or, or one of the other product gauges? Um. Uh, it's so it's sort of going to be sort of like proto freelance off of the uh, Albany and Susquehanna. Hmm. Um, sure. Basically, basically, I'm a fan of the Delaware and Hudson. Uh, okay. For a while, for a while there, I was I was doing like sort of like the transition era, uh, but then uh, uh, with the model train club I belong to, it seems that the uh, people were. Uh, uh, there was a, we were in South Glens Falls, New York, and uh, one of our members turned around and actually built the actual South Glens Falls local, you know, had the engine, had the, what the appropriate cars were and all that. And uh, 
at the at the show that actually a couple of the guys who actually worked on the train was there and nobody noticed because <laughs> because it's a train that is like oh okay it's just another train but it's one of those things of i also found out you know it's like it, once you get uh with the older stuff you know it 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 looks out of place so it's like ooh, that's a you know that looks different uh but uh and, and that's one of the things of i started to uh also they also like running you know uh they had a uh, one time they ran the pay, uh the new york central pacemaker and that had a uh uh, they had about 80 cars on it. I mean, it took them a half an hour just to take it back off the track. Whereas, <laughs> where, whereas, you know, it's like, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, if I remember correctly, you know, in, eight, in the 1800s, I mean, it's like a 24 car train is considered long, if I remember correctly. That's correct. And uh, a lot easier to take, put on and take off the track. Right. <laughs> Great. Well, good. Well, welcome, man. Glad to see you uh, join in the club, so to speak. And, yes. uh, you know, what you'll find, I mean, well, you got Andy as your key contact, but uh, if you ever have any questions or what have you, you can always put it out to the group and somebody will have some answer for whatever you might need. Yeah, I'm finding out that uh, I... I have like all this useless information on railroads and all that, and I'm finding out that, well, it's it's not it's not in the eighteen it's not in the eighteen hundreds though. <laughs> <laughs> right, have to rebuild your uh, your brain trust on that. Yes, <clears throat> I get um, it. Yeah, cool. the the interesting thing is is that apparently there is a Broadgate Society in Britain. Right. So However. But yeah, that they're, yeah, they're doing Brunel Gage. <laughs> Never heard of that. Wow. Great Western. Uh, yeah, the Great Western. It was uh, se seven, seven foot and a quarter inches. Ooh. Yeah, but they got a lot of resources, um, like wheel sets and so forth, that you can yeah. probably use if you're, if you're scratch building in, in uh, American six foot gauge. So, yeah, right now, right now, my plan is to, you know, sort of like set up the layout in standard gauge, and then once my, uh, once I get the appropriate things of like a lathe and stuff like that to okay. broaden everything, then turn around and actually uh, uh, figure out how to do stuff in broad gauge. Cool. It'd be neat to see a layout of dual, uh, dual gauges. Yeah. Yeah, dual dual gauge where the standard is the narrow one, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, so one uh, of the places one of the places where that occurred was on the Great Western Railway in Ontario. I've been I've been looking up, been re reading up on various topics lately, and and gauge has come up quite a bit. So, um, in the time when there were gauges were all over the place and interchange of freight cars was not very widespread, fast freight lines arose to, to expedite um, <clears throat> through shipments. And one of the fast freight lines was called the Blue Line, and it ran through on the Great Western from, I think from Suspension Bridge over the, um, Niagara River to Detroit and on the Great Western which was five foot six and so they dual gauged it by laying what they called what a third rail to what they called narrow gauge so that the blue line cars could run between the Michigan Central and the New York Central across the Great Western but one contemporary report said that they ran, well, as we would call them, the standard gauge and the broad gauge in the same train. Oh, and I wow. think that's just, I mean, that just seems like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe that they actually did it. 
and especially since it wasn't four rail, it was three rail. Yeah. So that must have been a pretty weird looking train to see that go by, you know? <laughs> Just, yeah, the... they did that for a while and, until the great, until the um, uh, Canadian roads standard gauged. Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing is uh, the suspensions bridge, if it's the one I'm thinking of, at one time, had it, it was actually three gauge. It, uh, it had the, 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 on the inside was the standard gauge. And I, I'm not sure which one was north or south, but one side was the three and a half uh, or five and a half. And then the other side had the six foot gauge. Jesus. <laughs> wow. Well, six foot gauge ran through from New York to St. Louis. Right. Um, the Erie was six foot gauge and their connection in Northern Pennsylvania was the Atlantic and Great Western down into Ohio where the connection was the Ohio and Mississippi that ran all the way to St. Louis. So you could get you could do six foot gauge through from New York City to St. Louis, and that's a whole area of railroad history that just is sort of forgotten. But there was really quite a bit of six foot gauge. Yeah, you know, one of the things the one of the things I was when I was starting to look into this, I was trying to figure out how how it was des, how it was des, designated because everyone is like you know you got uh h-o-n-3 h-o-n two and a half 30 you know it's like but it's always n it's like but it's like okay what's you know the the larger one and uh, well i i think if you build your layout you'll be the first person to ever do it and you get to decide <laughs> <laughs> call it, call it like, h-o-b-6 or something <laughs> well, well, the, the, interest, the interesting thing is i have come across uh there's a I guess there was an argument between uh, Proto 48 and regular uh, uh, O gauge. Yeah, they call it OW5. OW5. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, so that that uh, when I found that out, it's like okay, we're going to go W, which actually makes sense because W is a lot wider than N. Yeah. Actually, Bernie Kempinski's layout is actually to scale. He's building an O scale, and it's, of course, inch and a quarter. And the road he's actually modeling was a five foot gauge railroad. Yep. So he didn't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be sure you pick what you want to build. <laughs> That's well, great. The uh, thing is, the uh, the they still use five foot gauge, right? Uh, in Russia, oh, actually, no, wait a second, it's in Finland. Russia yeah. decided to knock off a couple of millimeters and all that to go metric, but uh, I guess uh, the the Finnish, which is still at five foot gauge, can run on uh, Russian rails. Because well, two millimeters is well within tolerance. Good. Well, and we will look forward to uh, seeing what kind of progress you make in your venture to build a light. And you're doing a HO scale. Yes, it's, it's oh. HO scale. Um, right now, uh, as I said, I'm standing with standard gauge, so I am trying to find all the. All the different styles of, uh, uh, you know, the, the ever so fun popular different uh, HOCL equipment. Oh yeah, which is ninety percent uh, uh, tender drive. So that's one <laughs> thing I'm gonna see about getting rid of that. Uh, Keep us posted was, on that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, I was actually hoping you did, you know. Uh, you guys had that. You know, uh, I would assume you guys you know, figure that one out already. Okay. Check out there, our, there's uh, actually a River Rossi, yes, the, the Malker. Um, there is a version of that with the motor in the engine and not the tender. 
I got one of those, but yeah, so do I, I got two of them also. So oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is the only one I found out that uh, has the motor not in the tender. Right. Of course, it takes up the entire cab. Right. <laughs> right. But, when did they start using treated ties? 1870s, 1880s. Okay, so if you're prototypical, you'd actually have untreated ties back in our time. Yes. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, would they be square or round? Yes. <laughs> Bingo. Good answer, DC. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, one of those answers. A combination thereof. Right. I mean, sometimes they would flatten out two of the sides. That's yeah. right. Oftentimes, yeah. it would depend on uh, who, who got the contract, and the contractor would um, do what he pleased unless you specified in the contract that they had to be squared. So for instance, on the Union Pacific, the, the ties were as rough as could be, but on the Central Pacific, they were, they were actually squared, uh, properly hewn ties. Wow. So it, it was a question of if a contractor got a contract, you could have variants you know, between stretches of line. Right, wow, yep. Yeah, I, that's one of the things I struggled with too is um, how to take these uh, prefab ties from microengineering and make them look at least something like they've been hewn. So right. I right. went along after after a lot of the layout was down, I went along with a couple of nippers and just trimmed the ends off to make them look like they were hewn. Right. That only took a week. <laughs> well, once you but get the, once you get them weathered. And you get the the ballast in, you know, you basically just see the top of the tie. Right. Right. So maybe yeah. a little bit of the ends. It's great. I love the look. You know, it's just got that rustic, rough look, and it it really contributes to the the period vibe you're trying to create. If you look closely at the pictures of uh, City Point, you will see that around City Point they have a lot of square ties. But as you get out farther, they've got rounded ties. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, maybe, yeah, yeah. I could see that they wanted something, you know, more, uh, uh, more pristine, if you will, where there's a lot of traffic, but out on the main line, it's you know, let's just get the track laid. Yeah. Well, cool. here's a Here's a silly question. Uh, when did they stop using strap rail? Not silly. Oh, boy. I think they were still using that even during a little bit past the war, right, John? Right. Yeah. Uh, it, they stopped laying strap rail in the 1840s, but a lot of it just hung around until after the Civil War. It depended on the railroad and the economic <laughs> Uh, condition of the railroad were they flush with cash they they converted early um were they a backwater railroad they stuck with it so and, and geographically so it, you know uh, answers all over the place on that yeah there were yeah, a lot of railroads in the south that were running strap rail yes. during the war I, right. I, I don't expect they changed over very fast correct I actually experimented that with that once, taking some brass flat uh, stock and putting it over a wood stringer. Uh, and that's where it began and ends in that one experiment. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I'm not that no. insane. No, it looked great. But you, you know, Tom, um, they're um, getting back to um, Broad gauge and and Brunel and the Great Western seven foot. He used a bulk road, which was he had a uh, a bulk of timber under the rail, and there are actually people now that are doing road bed of that uh, on shapeways. So it wouldn't be improbable uh, to do strap rail if you had a shapeways um, preformed track bed, and you could just slide the uh, strap along. Oh, oh. Yeah. Times change. I, yeah. <laughs> I, should, I should start building a railroad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we already this, have a railroad. 
<laughs> make it be like an old track they don't use anymore. So it doesn't matter if it's not functional, but I thought of making it, it would look so cool, but I haven't had the guts to do it yet. That's a great idea. I got one section where I had it ripped out. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. I needed another scenery project. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. You're welcome. <laughs> and yeah, Ed, gee whiz. That's great. Good. You know, I'd heard that in the South, part of the reason they went to five foot is because a lot of the freight would be cotton, which would be relatively light. And because a light, it was such a light load, they could have a really wide rail. I didn't realize all this wide gauge was up north. Um, do they? Because they're, they're, I assume they're more industrial. It's going to be coal and heavy goods. I don't think the gauge would have anything to do with the load bearing. It would be the weight of the rail, wouldn't it? Yeah, largely. Uh, the South got into five foot because the South Carolina Railroad was yeah. five foot. That was the first big railroad in the South. Everybody just copied the South Carolina Railroad. Oh. But yeah, there, there was five foot gauge uh, elsewhere in the country too. I mean, right. it was pretty much a mixed bag the first 10, 15 years after yeah. rail was in, introduced. Yeah, because there's, uh, I remember there was, uh, I think the Mohawk and Hudson, which was the first one in New York State, was. Uh, uh, four foot nine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Pennsylvania was four foot nine also, if I remember correctly. Yes, it was. Um, it was four foot nine only after the Civil War when they had to incorporate the Ohio roads into the system. All the roads in Ohio by law were four foot 10 inches. Right, Ohio mm -hmm. gauge. And they had to compromise. They moved the, uh, when, when the Pennsylvania bought the, uh, some Ohio roads heading for uh, Chicago. They just narrowed them to five foot nine and then they widened the rest of their system to, to four foot nine to match. Hmm. But that didn't happen until after the war. That, that only lasted until, well, I don't know. Um, I think they had them mostly changed over back to standard gauge by the 1890s. Mm. Although I remember that somebody was saying that they still had some stretches of five nine on branch lines, or four foot nine on branch lines up past the turn of the century. Mm. In Pennsylvania, John? Yeah, this is the Pennsylvania. Yeah, interesting. But you know that that, that half inch really didn't make that much difference with interchange of cars. They they uh, had special wheel treads. The Ohio. Um, uh, trains operating in Ohio had uh, thicker yeah. wheel treads to uh, alleviate some of the problems they encountered. So, so if, if there were so many different gauges, is that because the, the manufacturers of the equipment? So if I had a railroad, I bought certain equipment from Rogers, that, that would dictate the gauge of the line I'd have to uh, lay? I don't think it was that so much as you had a promoter who was enamored of such and such a gauge. And at the time, no one really had any idea about which gauge had a preference over the other, other than maybe Brunel, who took a, a more uh, engineering point of view. Uh, so you had someone who was, who was gung-ho on six foot. They'd order their equipment uh, at, at six foot. Um, uh, Ohio, for example, um, four foot 10 inches came into being because the first locomotive bought for Ohio, the Sandusky, I think it was, uh, happened to be a, a, a locomotive that I think it was intended for New Orleans and had been built a four foot 10 inch gauge, um, but it was not purchased and they had it sitting around. So the promoter of the first line in Ohio said, okay, I'll buy it. And they built a four foot 10 inches. Um, so I think it was more, more haphazard. And at the time there was, you know, the, like the debate with, uh, Fairley and narrow gauge and Palmer, um, the, the engineering world wasn't really decided on which was, a, a, a good and proper gauge from an engineering point of view. And now, you know, in hindsight, we know it probably would have been better to have had a broader gauge, but we got standard gauge because it was convenient. Right. Cool. Yeah, well, thank you. 
talking about those um, using the wide wheels to accommodate slight differences in gauge. Uh, some of those wheels had five foot, not five foot, uh, five inch wide tread, and that could accommodate four foot eight and a half up, you know, four foot ten, all the ah. in betweens. But when you look at HO scale wheels, the traditional HO scale wheels, what they call code 110, 110 thousandths. Well, that's about 10 inches right there. So they are way wider than any prototype would be. But one car, if you want to see something that has those wide um, True. wheel treads, they, the Lincoln private car funeral car had those wheel treads. And when you look at pictures of it, it's pretty apparent. And if you think about it, you know, the one and only time Honest Abe rode on that, he went over half of the, you know, or three quarters of the union states through all, for all those different gauges. And that's how they could do it because that car was built with those wide wheels. Interesting. In, in the pictures, they're, they're pretty visible. It, you don't, you don't think about it, but once you notice it, you can't miss it. Right. right. I'll have to take a look at those. I never thought of that. Yeah. Good. Okay. And that's the homework for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good. Okay, gentlemen. Well, uh, does anybody have any final comment or anything before we close it out? All right. Hey, well, Roger. I want to thank. Go ahead. Did have a question for Roger? You wanted some information on the camels that Jerry and Al and I were doing. Who was asking about the camels at our last at our at our Saturday? Was that you? Yeah. So I'm I just I sent you a chat, but I'm gathering up all the stuff from all of our correspondence back in 2019 and 18 when we were working on the uh, camels. So I'll I'll send it off to you. Who's that to? You're on mute, Roger. Roger. That would be great, Ron. Thank you. And thank oh, you for getting me off just, of mute. I'm just trying to sake. pull it and just trying to pull it all together because it's all over the place in my email saved folders. So Got I'll it. get it all pulled together. And, and the where you can get it from um, if, if you're gonna get some of the things that we made on Shapeway that might assist in like the, the uh, engine and that kind of stuff, I'll try to get all that together. I'd really appreciate it because then I could explore it thoroughly and determine my options. So thank you. See what works for you. Yep. And by the way, that roundhouse is two foot, the 170 foot scale, and it's two foot on the layout. Okay. I went Excellent. Ahead. Ron, <laughs> um, I would be interested in information on the camels too, if you don't okay. mind copying me on that. Sure. Thanks very much. Well, I want, I want to thank DC and Ron and Paul for taking the time to put those presentation, the presentations together for us. And uh, gentlemen, you have a great week or two until we see you next time. Um, all the best. Stay well and build something. <laughs> thank Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Do our best. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, guys. Have a great time at Amherst. <laughs> yes, <Thanks>. Amherst. <laughs> Bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs>